The Lady Long novel is like, uh, it's like a blueprint, it's an archetype for everything that has happened in crime writing in Scotland and further afield in the last, what are we now, almost 40 years. Well, we've got a terrible admission. I read very little crime fiction. Yeah. Always did. <laughs> <laughs> read a few writers and I thought, yeah, that's terrific. And I wanted to do something like that, but I'm not. And that's why when I went to bloody Scotland, I was so overwhelmed, because I'm not really an aficionado. I'm just a strange person who came in <laughs> and played a book with a form and then went Just wandered in and wrote the best crime novel ever and then yeah. fucked off again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't no, but I mean, like, I mean, I mean that truly humbly. I don't, I don't know much about it. Maybe that helped, because I had no preconceptions about how you cheer up the plot or anything. I thought, I'm just going to try and make real people in a bad place, in a bad situation. And, and I always wanted that it would be, that the people and the place wouldn't be sold out for the sake of the plot. The character came first, and I wanted to write about him because I liked the abrasiveness of him and yet the compassion of him. To me, laid law. He goes to bad places, he's involved in bad stuff, he's not somebody living in the Riviera. And then I thought, that's a, that's a way to get into Glasgow, because I'm, I'm a convert to Glasgow. Um, I come from Kilmarnock, which is 20 miles, but it's quite a far 20 miles. <laughs> and, uh, I went to uni in Glasgow and I loved it. I just loved the feel of the whole city. And I thought, I want to write about that. And so I, but I put the two together. I thought, this has got to be a detective novel set in Glasgow. Mind you, when it came out, a journalist in Glasgow wrote a long piece saying, how dare he come from Kilmarnock to write about it? It's 20 miles away. <laughs> I've got long eyesight, you know. Long so I wanted to bring, to make it not just a murder where the people are all just subject to the plot, but they exist as themselves and the murder happens within their lives and within their own city. There's a woman walking past with a pram as they walk down the street to go somewhere. And I said something like, uh, a woman passed them, gazing lovingly into the pram she was pushing, as if she had just invented the first baby. <laughs> and there's another sentence that says, it was as if the world was being given another chance. And they don't mention it, but that's there. And I like that thing, there's a whole sense of life going on around the murder around the detectives that even even if they don't see it or comment on it or notice it, that there's all that hopefully vividness of life going on around about. This is a story where I mean it's not a who done it, so why done it. The murderers identified in the first pages. And it's a scene where Laidlaw, towards the end of the investigation, Laidlaw and Harkness, they pretty well know it's it's a boy and they've find out from uh, another character where his mother lives. You felt as if the ornaments had been fixed upon foundations. Rudeness, anger, disorder didn't happen here. The nearest thing to turmoil would be when the tea was stirred. <laughs> the keeper of the grotto was older than they had expected. Greying hair, neatly done, glasses, and navy blue twin set imitation pearls. She had agreed that she was Mrs. Bryson. I'd listened to Laidlaw explain it was about Tommy, and had asked them in, glancing at their feet as if they might be muddy. What about Tommy's father? What about him? Where is he, Mrs. Bryson? It was over in a moment. Her concentration flickered, and when her eyes went bland again, Harkness was left wondering if what he had seen in them could really have been that depth of hate. Perhaps more had been cooking here than the wholesome meals a growing boy would need. I remember a dinner with Gordon Brown, this guy Bob Shrum, who was a, I think he was a speechwriter for Kennedy. But he said to me, I'm going to tell you two things, one you like and one you won't. One, you write like an angel. Two, if you lived in America, you'd be a millionaire. And, uh, thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> I don't live in America. <laughs> Everything I've written in journalism was something I wanted to explore, whether it was the war in Iraq, or whether it was my own background, or whether it was aspects of autobiography. To me, prose, poetry, 
you know, the sort of stuff I'm trying to write now, it's all the same thing. It's just it's a, an attempt to understand as far as you can the nature of experience, what this is all about.